So it's great to be with you all again, and uh, we're carrying on in Romans, but I just want to jump a little bit this morning, because there's a lot in the bit I'm going to read, but I just want to skim a little bit and then jump into something that I really feel God's laid on my heart. So Romans 8, sorry, Romans 7, I've been excited about Romans 8, but Romans 7, and we're going to jump in at verse 14, so we've been working our way through the book of Romans, and remember it's talked about... Um, Sinful man having no excuse before God. It talks about the righteous man having no excuse before God. It talks about the religious man having no excuse before God. It talks about God's faithfulness and it shows that through the life of Abraham, through the life of David. And then it talks about that no one's actually righteous other than Jesus. And then in chapter 5 we talked about peace and joy in God and knowing life through Jesus. Not life in Adam but life in Jesus. And chapter sin, we, it's entitled in my Bible anyway, it says death to sin and alive in Christ. And then it goes into chapter 7 which kind of takes you into something else. And you're beginning in chapter 7, it's almost gearing down, ready to run to chapter 8. And so far we're, we're running, it's doing really well. And then he goes into think, this little thing called struggling with sin. It's almost like, Ugh. we were kind of doing alright there, Paul, what are you jumping into this for? So verse 14 says this. We know that the law is spiritual, but I am unspiritual, sold as a slave to sin. Now Paul's going to make some comparisons between the difference between the flesh and the spirit. When I talk about flesh, it's not meaning, it literally means the skin. But in those days, it it meant more than just the skin. Often in some versions it says the sinful nature. In other versions it talks about our sinful desires. It's talking about those things inside us that wage war against us. The good that we want to is what we're going to get into against the things that we don't want to do. So he says that I am, the Lord is spiritual, but I am unspiritual. It's meaning in his own body. In the physical, he's unspiritual. So you've got to get this in your mind. He is spiritual in his spirit, but in his body, in his flesh, is unspiritual. Sold as a slave to sin. Because believe it or not, it's actually your body that dictates its terms to your mind about sin. Now if you don't believe me, check this out. When you, if you're desiring something, your body often tells you when you're hungry. If you go to a Chinese, it's usually about an hour after, your body starts telling you you're hungry. Because your body then sends signals to your mind, get some more food in your brains, put some more food in. You know, you never think about food till you try fasting. And then suddenly your mind's on it all the time. When it comes to sin, sin is your physical body that desires the pleasures of sin because it's often physical, but it sends signals to your mind and your mind starts thinking about it. That's why the Bible says, take every thought captive so you don't think about it, so you're not dwelling on it, so you're not going to do it. You'll never do what you're not thinking about unless you're driving. Because sometimes it's automatic that you just go down place and you wonder, how did I get here? Did I stop at that red light? I hope I did. Did that flash at me or somebody else? But let's not go there. But he continues. Verse 15, he says, I do not understand what I do. So this is Paul, one of the greatest minds talking about things of God. He said, I do not understand what I do. For what I want to do, I do not do. But what I hate, I do. It sounds like a recipe for a, a, a tagline. For Weight Watchers does that, doesn't it? You know, but I hate what I do. And if I do what I do not want to do, I agree that the law is good. As it is, it no, it's no longer I myself that do it, but the sin living inside me. I know that nothing good lives in me. That is, in my sinful nature. For I desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. For what I do... Is not the good I want to do. No, the evil I do not want to do, this I do. This I keep on doing. Now, if I do what it is I do not want to do, there's a lot of do's in this, isn't there? It is no longer I who do it, but the sin in living inside of me who does it. Now, it's not this has been used as an excuse for centuries for people to say, it was not me, it the devil made me do it. No, what he's saying in his flesh, is waging war against his spirit. 
Verse 21 says this, so I find this law at work. When I want to do the good, evil is right there with me. For in my, in my innermost, in my inner being, I delight in God's law. But I see another law at work in the members of my body, waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner to the law of sin that is at work within my members. What a wretched man I am. Who will rescue me from this body of death? Thanks be to God through our Lord Jesus Christ. So then, I myself, in my mind, am a slave to God, law, but in my sinful nature, I'm a slave. I'm a, a slave to the law of sin. In essence, what he's saying is, and this may be you, it may not be, but often, sometimes we want to do good and just can't do it. And sometimes we find ourselves doing things we didn't ever want to do. It's called a battle. And if any of us ever get through this battle where we stop having to battle with sin, it means he died. So if you finish with it, you're dead. But you're not dead, so you've still got a battle on. Every one of us has got, and this is one of the, the complex, it's one of the bizarre things because some people think that when you become a Christian, God makes everything right. Well, in your spirit, he does. In your spirit, you are a new creation. In your spirit, you've been set free. In your spirit, you've been sealed and nothing can contaminate you. The problem is that our body, we're into body, soul and spirit again, but our body is still living on this planet. And it's our body that dictates terms to our mind, but our spirit is dictating terms to our mind. And therefore, there's a battle going on in our minds and what we think about and what we believe and what we do. See, what you think about is often where you will go. It's amazing when I say to people, do you want to do something? And they'll say, I'll check it out. To me, that means no. Because if I wanted to do it, I'd go, yeah, let's do it. I will make it happen. You see, when you want to go on holiday, it don't matter what's going on in your life, you'll go. If you want a cake, I'll put it on that, and there's only one piece left, you will push past people if you want it. But if you're not sure you don't want it, you'll you make up an excuse. And Paul's talking about the fact that we're in this battle and we'll be in this battle until Jesus returns or we're called home. Between our flesh, our sinful nature, that Paul says, I have a sinful nature. Now people often question that, but Paul says, in my sinful nature. Now he could have been talking before he were a Christian, but actually writing this down in the present tense and he's using himself as an example. And he's saying there's a war going on. Guys, it's not wrong to be in a war. It's not wrong to be in a battle. And do you know sometimes you're not going to win in that moment? Because if you win, you wouldn't need to rely on Jesus. And that's often why we go through battles is because we, we need to learn to rely on Jesus more. But this is the interesting thing. And I've been thinking about this a lot. Because we often look at this and go, we talk about sins and these are bad sins. But actually, have you ever noticed that as the, the longer you work, walk with God, you don't have a problem with certain stuff anymore. You see, he says, the good I want to do, I do not do. But the evil I don't want to do. So there's two sides to that. You see, I might not be doing, be, be doing the things I did when I first became a Christian because I've grown up a little bit from there. But sin is not the things that you do wrong. It was initially. But as you walk with God, Sin becomes the things you don't do right. See, in James it says sin is knowing what you should do and not doing it. You see, we're so programmed when it comes to sin to think of adultery and murder, and I'm not doing them, so I'm all right, thank you very much. Yeah, you're not doing them, but are you doing the good that God called you to do? And this is a battle Paul's got. Paul's not talking about, well, I've not committed adultery, I've not murdered anybody, I've not stolen anything. He's not talking about, he's really talking about the good that he wants to do. And sometimes the struggle inside is not always, you know, I can't commit adultery, I can't commit adultery. It's not about that, but it's about doing the good because at the end of the day, we've got our comfort zones that we like. And we like to step into the things that God's got for us, but really we want it on our terms and not his terms. It, one of the battles, or one of the answers to the battle, there's lots and there's lots of verses, but I was reading through the Psalms, 
And I came across an interesting psalm and it just it kind of clicked in what I was going to say. And this is when I'm taking a 90 degree turn off what I've read earlier. And I'll probably come back to that next time. But in Psalm 77, it says this. This is verse where we're going to jump into it. Well, verse 4 says this. You have kept my eyes from closing. I was too troubled to speak. I thought about the former days and the years long ago. I remember my song in the night and my heart must have uh, mused in my spirit, in my, in my spirits in, inquired, that's right. In muse, muse means to ponder things through, to think about something. So keep that in mind. Will the Lord reject forever, he continues, this is verse seven. Will he never show favor again? As his unfailing love vanished forever, as his promise failed for, for all time, has God forgotten to be mercy? Has he, in his anger, withheld compassion? In the battle, in that time of struggle, that's what we often go to. Has God forgot to love me? Has God forgot? Now we know God doesn't forget. Except for he does forget your sin when you bring it before Jesus. He said, as far as the east is from the west, so far have I forgotten, forgetting. I've thrown it away, got rid of it. That's why I know God's not a woman. Because women don't forget anything you do wrong. Oh, come on, it's Sunday morning. Malcolm's leaving us now. It's like, oh. You can smile in church. But the truth is that God does forget our wrongdoings. But sometimes we can accuse God. See, the greatest sin is not the sin of adultery, murder, stealing, whatever else you want to put in that bracket. That's not the greatest sin. The greatest sin is often accusing God of not being who God is. And when you say stuff like, God has forgotten me. Really? <laughs> really? I mean, it's like one of your own kids saying, have you forgot me? How could I? And it continues. So sometimes we... Throw things out of God, asking questions as he rejected us, as he, as he forgot to show favour, as his unfailing love vanished, as his promise failed, well, all his promises are yes and amen, but sometimes we can think, that's great for them, but it's not great for me. Why is it God always answers their prayers and not my prayers? Why is it God always doing something in their life but never my life? Because we get into this cycle of thinking because our flesh is drawing us towards sin, but our spirit wants us to be alive in Christ and there's a battle going on. And then he continues, this is in the Psalms again, he says, Then I thought, there's a stop, then. I stopped thinking about questioning God's compassion, God's mercy and God's love. Then I thought, to this I will appeal. The years um, of the right hand of the Most High, I will, verse 11, I will remember the deeds of the Lord. Yes, I will remember the miracles of long ago. <coughs> I will meditate on your word and consider your mighty deed. Now for the psalm writer here, he's talking about what he did in Moses' life and all these other lives. But for us, the way that we win the battle in our mind is to think on what God's done for us. Think about what God's done for us. Well, I don't know if God's done it for you. You've got you saved. If you're not saved, I'll give an appeal. You can come out and get saved. Then you've got a testimony, haven't you? Is that alright? But if you're saved, you can remember. Think about your journey to Jesus. Think about what he did. Now, it may be explosive. It might be angels ripping her apart heaven and clouds and lightning and God booming out going, You! You need me! Or it might be just a quiet conviction going, Jesus, I need you. Either way... There was a point in your life where God took you as you were and he redeemed you, he brought you back to himself and he embraced you with love and compassion and he's given you an eternal future with him and he set you in a good place, a solid place and you think, well, I'm suffering. Well, suffering is only part of this earth and it will only last as long as you're here. After that, there's no suffering. But for those without Jesus, they may never suffer to the day they die, and then the eternity of suffering. That's why we've got to tell them about Jesus. But he says, 
I will remember your deeds of the Lord. I will remember the miracles. I will meditate on your word. I will consider your mighty deeds. One of the things that really helps me is to think about all the goodness of God and what he's done for me. Now, I don't mean to be selfish, but it's great what God's done in your life, but that doesn't mean anything to me. It's great testimonies. It's great what God's doing and I want to celebrate with you. But in the dark places, I need to know that God's with me. Like you need to know it's with you. It's no point listening to my testimony going, that's great for you, Johnny. Because when you're in it, you need him with you. But the word is true, but he says he'll never leave us or forsake us. His word is true, but he says in the dark places, I will sit there with you. I will walk through it with you. But he says, the psalmist says, I will remember. One of the things the devil always does, he tries to get you to question what God's done. And in those moments, that often leads to the question, well, am I really saved? Well, if you wasn't, you wouldn't ask that question. Before you were a Christian, you didn't say, I wonder if I'm not saved. I need to make sure I'm not saved. <laughs> Boom. Because I might be and I don't want to be. I've got to get out of that one. But now we are saved. I wonder if I'm saved. What a stupid question. You'd never ask that. Unless you were. Well, I don't feel saved. You know, you don't, when I, when I got married, someone said, what's it like to be married? I goes, I don't know. <laughs> well, they asked, what's it feel like to be married? I went, I don't know. It hadn't changed much since before we were married. Except for certain stuff. But I says, it just means there's two of us in the house. <laughs> Which can be awkward. Because you've got to get used to the idea of walking to the bathroom and all that sort of stuff but feelings wise it didn't change but I knew I was married because I had a ring on my finger I remember the wedding I had to smile I had an aching face and I went on the road to a fantastic even though it were only to Tenerife but it was still good but I didn't feel any different I didn't wake up the next day after getting married going woo I feel married I just woke up going life continues but now I've got somebody with me and getting saved Sometimes you might not feel any different. Sometimes in a problem you may not feel any different, but you know God's working with you. God's moving you through. Sometimes you might not feel God is there with you. But he said he will never leave you. So even if you can't see him, he's still there with you. Even if you don't want him to be with you, he's still there with you. I told you a story before. You know, I almost had a moment in my life where I kind of had enough about certain stuff and I kind of knacked. It's a Greek word, is that I'm sure, or Hebrew. But I kind of so I went off to do some stuff. I, I went to this nightclub and I just thought I'd go see some old guys that were there, see how things going. And I thought I'm going to really rebel. And I went and, and you know got me pint of coke because I was really on the edge. You know, as a backsliding Christian. And as I'm looking at, I wasn't really backsliding, but I thought I'm going to push it that way. And I've got me coke and I'm looking around this nightclub and I'm looking at all these people thinking. They need Jesus. They need Jesus. Oh, I can't talk about that because I'm, I'm, I'm kind of backsliding right here, right now. They need Jesus. They need Jesus. And I start twinning to people and I thought, oh, what am I doing? And I just thought, God, you're with me, are you? It would mean my pity party. I'd invited myself to my own surprise pity party and we were having a great time. But then I realised God turned up to my own private pity party and it wasn't that exciting anymore. I needed to get out of it and start living the life that God called me to do. You see, we need to remember not just our salvation, but what's God done for you since you got saved? That's why we remember communing, because we'll forget. And I encourage people, write things down, think about things, muse on things. Consider the goodness of God. Think about what he's done. Go to sleep thinking about the goodness of God. Think about what he's done for you. And if you can't think about anything God's done for you, get a biography of another believer and read theirs and go, well, thank you, Jesus, you're working on men. But I need it in my life. You see, the interesting thing with Paul is, he says, what a wretched man I am. We would have considered Paul, you know, so perfect and holy, yet he said, I'm wretched. Why? Because he knew it wasn't about the sins that he wasn't that he wasn't committing like murder and stealing and adultery and all those sorts of things he wanted to do so much more for God and he felt that was making him wretched because he saw you know what he wanted to do but I'll tell you this guys 
when you have an encounter with God, it doesn't matter how spiritual you think you are, we're all wretched before God. We're all no good before God. And you just, the closer you get to God, the more you realise how messed up we really are. Want to know how good you really are, messed up, is try doing some good stuff. Sold out for Jesus, you'll soon find out that we're kind of not making it. But in our flesh, we will not make it. But with Jesus with us, we can achieve anything for his glory. And that's why we need to remember, why is it, why is it, why is it? You talked, sorry Joe, uh, you talked to me about the, the as holiday recently. And I spent five days walking up to the Lake District and it rained for four days. But I walked it with a great time. I was having a great time in the rain. But I was having an amazing time. We got there and we had one sunny day. But Joe will tell you we had six rainy days. I tell you we had a great sunny day. Because I remember a great time. Talked to his friend that went and it was a waste of time. It was like, oh, rain. And I didn't get this for me. Porridge and blah, 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 he goes on about stuff. It's like, see, I always think, look at what God's in your own life. Why is it when I ask people certain stuff about their life, they always tell me what's gone wrong? Guys, life goes wrong. Let's well, suck that up, get over it. Everybody's life goes wrong, everyone's got problems. It's like sometimes we can, if you really want to be cheered up, go to the post office. Now, you can't do it now because I think everyone gets it online, but on a Tuesday morning when you're pension day, all those people would line up telling me all their ailments. Me back. Oh, you think your back is like bad? My back, my knees. I've got this, I've got that. The doctor says this, the doctor says that. And we go into this great list. Guys, I've got a breath in my lungs. So let's do something with that. You're never going to be perfectly fit, especially if you pass 21. It kind of goes downhill, I'm told. <laughs> it's happening. You know, come down seven. Yeah. You know what I mean? You do things and you're just not, you can't jump that fence like you once did. But life's life, and life's messed up, and life's cruel, and there's not enough love in the world as the song goes. There's all those things, there's not. But we've got Jesus, and we can share God's love. But if we focus on the negative that's in our lives, then all we'll expel is a negativity. But if we remember the goodness of God, if we remember the good deeds that God's done for us, if we remember how brilliant he's been and all the things we can consider and all the amazing things that's happened, and we ooze that. Now people will probably think you're crazy. Well, be crazy and happy. You know, some people need medication for all sorts. I think be happy with Jesus and look crazy. I mean, people won't want to talk to you. You get the seat on the bus empty, just look crazy. Have a t-shirt saying, I want to tell you about Jesus. So they won't sit next to you. It's one of those things. But, you see, God knows you, according to the Bible, he knows you by name. Now, people forget your name, but according to Isaiah 43, verse 1, he knows you by name. That's something to get excited about. You know, when you were at school, if you remember lining up in the teams... They call out somebody's name then, somebody's name. But when they start getting, like, I was never that good at football. I loved rugby, I'm good at rugby, but not football. So football team, I was one of the last few. And the only thought, I made, and if they didn't know that you, well, very nice, if they didn't know my name, they're just calling me out, come on out. But when I got playing, they wanted me on their team. I wasn't good at football, but I could take their best player out. That was my job. <laughs> The rugby player came out. <laughs> oh, sorry, mate. But God knows you by name. You know, your parents gave you the name, but God knows you by name. And you might not want to know him, but he knows you. You know, you might think he, you've tried to put God away in a closet somewhere in a box, but he still knows your name. He will fight for you according to Exodus 14, 14. He will fight for you. It's not better than having somebody will stand up for you. See, I wasn't, well, I wasn't ever bullied at school. It wasn't my thing. You know what I mean? I just snarled at people. It kind of wore them off. I wasn't that big, but that's what I did. But when I saw somebody getting bullied, I didn't like it. And I'd usually intervene. 
Now the person getting bullied were very appreciative of the fact that I intervened. At least that time, we'd get after it. I'm talking about the 1980s bullying, not the you've got glasses on or you have this colour hair, bullying where they actually hit you and really messed you up, you know, that sort of bullying. So when we got involved, they were really happy. But the Bible says that God is fighting for us. God is on our side as someone. He's fighting for you. He knows your name. Why? Because that's why you can remember him. That's why you can muse over the goodness of God. He thinks about you. You know, I'll, I'll, I've got to confess, guys, there's times I don't think about you. Sometimes I'm in my own world. I've been in my own world this week putting some plastic sheeting or, uh, on my bathroom walls and we've got some up and we've realised they've sent us two different colours. So you were not on my mind. <laughs> now I need to take some of that back off. Which is all awkward now because it's all stuck on. But God not only knows your name, not only does he fight for you, but he thinks about you. In fact, it talks about when he sings over you. That's a picture of a parent holding a child as a baby singing over them. Yes, I did that to you too. We did. I did. And that's pretty said. That he sings over us. Oh, we should worship God. Yes. But he sings over us. He also says that he has a plan for us. You're not an accident. You might have been a shock to your parents. But you are not an accident. You're planned by God. Not planned by parents sometimes. But planned by God. God is our refuge. Our hiding place. Our place we can run to. These are things we can be thankful for. These are things we can remember. Remember in the past when you were in your darkest moments and you found refuge in God. This is Psalm 62 verses 6 to 8. Remember those times. I've got verses I can quote off by heart. Why? Because in the time when I needed them, they were there and they stuck. That's where I remember. I remember those times. He is always with us. Matthew 28, 20. He's always with us. He said he'll never leave us. I'm pretty cool about that. It's awkward when you want to do something wrong. It's awkward when you say something that's not very polite and Jesus is like, you know, he's standing there with you. Sorry, mate. Sorry, boss. You know what I mean? But we come out with something. Why? Because we've got a battle raging inside us between our spirit. And the things we want to do, we don't do them. And the things we do not want to do, we do we do, do them. And if you've got a dog, there's a lot of do-do, 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 do's. And there's a lot of do-doing in all this stuff. Romans 7 is really talking about the battle that we will face for all our lives. And I was questioned, God, about the some people that get saved. And it's like they just excel and grow. And there's others that seem to struggle. And the, the thing that God really laid on my heart is that when we become a Christian, some of the stuff we did before we were a Christian will always be a challenge to us thereafter. It'll always be a challenge. Because your, yourself, your body, you, were so used to doing certain things that when you get saved, you can no longer do them. So it's always going to be a challenge. See, the devil won't tempt you with things that don't tempt you. But he'll always tempt you with those things that will tempt you. And it took, so for some people, it took you 60 years to mess up your life completely before you cried out to him. So it's 60 years of sorting things out. When kids get saved, when people get saved when they're kids, it's a lot less baggage. But sometimes they do take on other baggage as they grow and they get into certain stuff but God's gracious God's compassionate but saying there's a battle that should force us or enable us or help us run to Jesus because it's a who will save me from this Paul said who he didn't say what it's Jesus and in the middle of the battle we remember what he's done for us. And if he's done it once, he'll do it again. I mean, it's not like some people, if you lend a tenor off them, 
and you ask him a second time and say no. It's not like that. I'm, God's not a God who you can lend a tenor off. God's a God who cares to enable you to walk with the good things he's got for you. And the battle that rages in our minds, if it brings confusion, if it brings strife in our internal being, that's not of God. Because God, the Bible says that God hasn't given us a spirit of fear, but of power, love and sound mind, or self-discipline or versions. If there's confusion, ask the question, where's this confusion coming from? Where it's coming from, we're overthinking stuff. Instead of thinking on the goodness of God and what God's done for us and what God uh, has been doing. I mean, if you've got kids, that's a crazy thing because you just remember all the goodness of God just by looking after your own kids. It's amazing. <laughs> you think, oh, God's not done no for me. And God reminds you. Hmm. You've got kids. Yeah, you've been with them all their lives, so it's kind of good. If you haven't got kids, if, you, if you're married, if, if whatever, it's a case of God's still doing things in your life. Remember the testimonies of what you've shared in the past. Remember the good things that you've talked about. They're the things that will help you fight the battle. They're the things that will stop you getting confused. They're the things that will stop the strife inside you. But when we forget... That's when we enter into the dark place. When we try to justify... Guys, I, I tried it my own way. And I kind of messed it up. So I needed Jesus. And I think it's interesting when people tell me all the time, well, I just need it. To, I, I'm doing it my way. And how's that working for you? Not you guys, obviously. But how's it working for you? Why is it? <laughs> Why is it? We do everything we can... We do what the experts say, we do what Auntie Mabel says, we do what the latest magazine says, and eventually when all that doesn't work, we come to Jesus. I have learned it's easy to come to him first. Because Auntie Mabel might have some good ideas, but it's not Jesus. And the magazine definitely doesn't have any good ideas. Keep away from someone else's stuff. And, you know, even the experts don't have the expert knowledge because we were designed by God and he knows how we work. Now, a doctor knows how we work physically, generally. And the psychiatrist or psychologist knows something about the mind, but not everything. But God knows what we really like. And he knows it's our spirit that's inside us. That is the power source of all hope and all love and all joy and all compassion. It's our spirit but if our mind starts shutting the doorways down from our spirit, all we get is that ugly self back. And, it, and I'll admit, Johnny comes back every now and then, the old Johnny. And sometimes I've got to shoot him again and get rid of him. Because I don't like him. But sometimes he comes back. Now most of you will never see him. Joe does every now and then. That's called being married. And other people, sometimes he props back up. Why? Because sometimes the things I don't want to do, I do. And the things I want to do. Sometimes I want to be really nice to people. But sometimes I just say what's on my mind. And it pops out. And I can see the shock on their faces. And it might be true what popped out, but it's not necessarily nice. But it comes out. Some of you think it's one of your greatest strengths. Yes, but it's also my greatest weakness. But I speak my mind. But there's always a battle. And guys, you'll always have a battle. But with Jesus, you can overcome the battle. You can be somebody who overcomes and stands tall. But the problem is that when you've overcome one battle and you rest, there's another one coming. Because the devil will never give up on you until he can drag you into hell. But God will never give up on you as he upholds you and stands you on solid ground and as you fix your mind on him, he will give you peace in your heart in the middle of a storm. So you can stand tall and just keep on going. So I hope that's been encouraging for you. We'll get back into Romans next time. But I hope that's been encouraging for you to understand you're in a battle and it's not that... There's not something wrong if you're in a battle. It's just a season that's in your life and the battles don't last forever 
but I will finish with this. I never quite know when the battle finished or when the battle changed. If you study World War II, they'll often say, you know, Stalingrad, when the Russians pushed out or surrounded the Germans, that was the change of the Second World War. Well, it might have been. And in your own battles, we don't always know when it is because sometimes we're still battling, but it's getting easier. And then I don't know when the next battle really starts because sometimes you, you're already in it before you realise you're in a battle. It's not like a lion jumps out on you and he's, whoa, you know, it's not like that sort of battle. The battles are often creep up on us, but they also sometimes disappear slowly. And we're never quite sure, are we coming out of the battle or are we going into a battle? Have I finished one? Am I in the middle of it? But God says, regardless, I still got a plan. <coughs> and you are stronger than you think because you've survived till now. You're still walking, you're still going for God. You're still breathing air, you're still here. Let me pray for you. Heavenly Father, I just thank you, Lord, for everybody here, everybody listening to this, and I pray, Lord, that you will help, Lord, what's been said, what you've said, Lord, to speak to people's hearts, let it sink deep into their hearts. Let us realise, Lord, the battle's not wrong, but to give in, Lord, is. Help us to stand with you, to be, to be encouraged by you, giving glory to you. Help us to remember your goodness and all the mighty things you've done for us. In the name of Jesus, amen.